Hey gang, Uncle Todd here, along with Sonny. And for tonight's film, we're going to need a bit of a history lesson. Uh, back in the previous century, when film production was first started, there was a separate style of uh, film that uh, was starting to be made. And this continued uh, into the 30s and 40s. Uh, it was called uh, what they called back then a race film. Uh, basically it's a film with an all-black cast and they generally hit all kinds of genres comedy, horror, mu musicals, adventure films, horror films, oh, I said that already, yeah. and, and westerns. Um, now uh, the film we're going to look at today is called Lucky Ghost, and it is an all-black picture. Uh, in fact, I think the only white people even associated with this is the director, uh, William Bodine, who uh, made a ton of low-budget pictures. He was called One Shot because due to the uh, low budgets, he uh, only took one shot for each scene, period. Uh, you've probably seen that parodied in uh, the film Ed Wood. And the uh, producer, uh, Jed Buell, who was known for making a lot of these pictures, as well as other pictures that would have been considered oddball. Uh, his most famous production is, of course, Terror of Tiny Town, in which he cast a pretty standard Western plot with a group of little people actors. Most prominent would be the hero, Billy Curtis, who was a had a long career as a supporting player, and this is one of his few starring roles. Uh, the weird thing about that film isn't that it's all little people. It's that except for the ponies they ride, everything else is the size that someone of my stature would have used. You know, what people would have called standard or regular. And it's just odd, because in this world where everyone is so small, why would everything they live in and use be so large? But I guess that's where the humor would be, because it's it's a pretty basic Western plot. Uh, probably his longest-running series would have been uh, The Bronze Buckaroo, starring Herb Jeffries as a singing cowboy. They made several of those films. Uh, this film, Lucky Ghost, pairs our friend Mantan Moreland with a one-time partner he had on the vaudeville uh, circuit, Effie uh, e. Miller, who uh, was a playwright, actor, and lyricist. He worked a lot on stage, he even worked on Broadway, and uh, was even nominated for a Tony Award uh, for one of his compositions. Uh, sadly, this was posthumously in 1979. Uh, the other major producer on this film is uh, Marco Bruce Sheffield who uh, plays the villain. He was uh, a producer and a writer for a lot of these films. Uh, he worked for the company uh, Dixie Entertainment which uh, specialized in 
films like this. Uh, mainly these films played in um, the South in segregated movie houses and in the North in the uh, lower income urban areas. Uh, mainly the where the black neighborhoods were. And uh, comparing them to other films, these are threadbare budget-wise. Uh, very, very threadbare. And I mean, even a B-movie from like Monogram or PRC looks tons uh, more uh, production value than these films had. But what they lacked in that, they made up for in talent. And this is the second of three films that Mantan and Miller made. Uh, the first was Mr. Washington Goes to Town, and then after this one was Professor Creeps, uh, another horror comedy. Now, uh, this film starts with uh, Miller and Mantan playing Jefferson and Washington, making one of the few films where Mantan didn't play Jeff. Uh, we start with them on the road. They've been kicked out of the town they were in in the previous film. And they've been walking a long time, and when they stop to take a rest, we get our first sight gag of the film. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, do my puppies hate. Boy, good fish. Oh, oh. That's a pretty good sight gag. Uh... After a uh, unsuccessful attempt to steal a chicken from a farmer and getting shot at, they get a bit of better luck when a couple of uh, rich men, their car runs out of gas and they send their chauffeur to a gas station to get more, which uh, gives Wash and Jefferson an uh, opportunity to uh, indulge in a little uh, Dice game. I didn't see y'all. Two sevens in a row. You're pretty good. Bet you can't do that again. Uh, is you talking money or just conversation? Put your foot on the wallet. Don't let it go away. Come on. Shoot, shoot. Go ahead. Shoot. Don't let your foot. You can't do it again. Go ahead. Who can't do it again? Make that eight. Eight up from the kid. Make that eight. You think he's a man? Make it. Make it. Gonna make it wallet? I love that transition. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Hey, I thought this film was called The Lucky Ghost. Is Mantan a ghost? No. This has a bit of a odd structure. Uh, basically, it's in three acts. Uh, the first act, we just completed. Uh, the second act is the nightclub. And uh, Mantan will get into another gambling run. And then the third act is where the ghosts come in. So, gotta be a little patient. Well, they, uh, they get to the country club and sanitarium. It's an odd combo. And uh, they're met by a very pretty hostess who has them sign in. Pretty good joke. Um, Mantan, of course, Washington is, of course, taken with the hostess. Not a good idea. You see, her boss is also her boyfriend. And she introduces him after uh, Jeff and Wash have some shenanigans with a small face. Glad to meet you, sir. And Mr. X. Uh, 
Yes, yes he does. Well, uh, they head into the cafe area and uh, while they chow down on two whole chickens, one for each of them and all the fixings, uh, the boss Blake uh, he finds Someone's trying to make time with his girl. Excuse me. <laughs> Daniel! What's the trouble, boss? Remove that. Prelude of what's to come. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the hostess then goes in to do her other job, which is singing in the cafe. Now, she was a pretty good singer, but uh, Washington thinks she's taking a shine to him as he has to her. And he starts dancing with her. And Blake sees, and he does not have a very good reaction to what's going on. It's a dire lit cigar. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> well, once Mantan realizes the situation he's in, uh, Washington, he and Jeff try to make a uh, run for it, but they don't make it. While that's going on, the man who Blake had punched out earlier wakes up and tries to get back into the nightclub. I'm going to take a whack at you myself. Now get going. Oh, so you want to get tough too, huh? Yeah, just happens to be a little graveyard next door. Where'd you think the ghosts were going to come from? Anyway, uh, Blake gets uh, revived, and uh, he's ready to go back out there and tear into those two when his hostess explains they got money. And uh, Blackstone, who's talking to them, has realized this too. Now, Blackstone is um, Blake's connection to the police. Basically he gives Blackstone money and some of that money goes to the police and his place doesn't get raided. Uh, he was the man he accidentally punched first uh, before he knocked himself out. So finding out that they've got money he goes over to make up with the guys and Wash overreacts seeing him. Stand back. Hey! Good. Did, did I do that? Well, good gracious of me, I... <laughs> <laughs> mm, sorry. I think it's the only time I've ever seen Mantan actually get to defend himself. And it's kind of nice to see. Uh, anyway, uh, once re revived, uh, Blake apologizes, treats them all to a uh, lots of drinks and then when he thinks the time is right he shows him the special room in the uh, establishment where uh, the real fun begins <laughs> Don't miss it. 
Yeah, Blake's probably going to regret introducing them to his uh, little gambling room. Oh, the uh, the guy in the cemetery wakes up and is not too happy where he's uh, found himself. Can you move? Because if I try and you don't, then I know I'm dead. Well, here I go. Give me the answer. Unfortunately for him, his uh, jubilation is uh, short-lived. This thing, brother, I can't stand it much longer. You said it, brother. I haven't had any sleep since I opened that place. I told Ezra what would happen if he left the place to that no-good nephew of ours. Wait a minute. Look there. Where'd you come from? You don't belong here. You... Tell me. Yeah, pretty obvious joke, but uh, still funny. Well, now we finally have ghosts, and not fake ghosts that are revealed uh, to be uh, someone trying to scare everybody out to get the property for themselves. Bonafide ghosts. So, they uh, wake Uncle Azure up and get his spirit up out of his grave and send him into the... Uh, establishment to kind of reconnoiter and see what really is going on in there. At uh, which point he scares both uh, the doorman and the hatchet girl. Oh. Oh. Uncle Ezra. I thought you was dead. I am. Wait, what you doing here then? I'm going to see what all this racket is about. I'll say, what time is it? Past <laughs> eleven. Thanks. Proceeding into the game room, he then watches silently as. Blake, not doing too well. Washington has broken the bank, so they make one last bet for the establishment. But Blake, he's throwing in some special new dice. Throw them dice. Uh-oh, box cars. Yeah, and that's why we'll be sleeping if you lose like their luck has run out. But Blake didn't count on uh, Wash's nervousness. Now? Uh, give me that dice, will you? Get that dice. Can you all find it? Uh, never mind, brother. Would you give me them dice over there, please? Catfish, you done it again! Lady Luck, I knew you was... Ah. That's that. Wash and Jeff are now the new owners of the establishment. Well, at least Blake still has his lady love. over for Wash. Well, that's the last straw. Blackthorn takes him back to the office where he's got an idea about how to handle this situation. Meanwhile, Ezra has returned to the cemetery and tells them that uh, Blake lost the house in a, in a bet and the new owners, they're going to be even worse than he is. Well, that's too much for them. They're going to do something about it. Uh, but first, they scare the doorman and the chauffeur of 
Washington Jeff, who have the most logical reactions to this. Ezra goes into the office where he hears Blackthorn and Blake uh, discussing their plan. Uh, basically, a uh, day or two, Blackthorn will uh, have his police buddies come in and close the place down and confiscate it. Then, a couple weeks, Blake can move back in and they can start back up. Ezra is not going to stand for that one. You lost it. If you try to open it up again, we is going to haunt you 24 hours a day as long as you is here. To say nothing of what we'll do to you when you join us in the hereafter. Scared? They run for it. Uh, by the way, the hat check girl's been telling uh, other people that stopped by that this place is haunted. Those people are leaving too. Well, the ghosts then settle in on the people in the cafe area and uh, start to scare them out of the place too. Eventually, uh, the only ones left is Jeff, Wash, and the Hostess, and uh, well, they're not spared either. <laughs> After getting chased by a suit of armor, uh, they run to barricade themselves in the office. Whereupon Jeff and Wash locked the hostess out. <laughs> oh, no chivalry with this group. <laughs> anyway, they find themselves trapped there with a ghost who makes certain demands to uh, really be released. Destitute again, they rush out. But uh, after they've gone a certain distance and have stopped to get a rest, uh, Wash reveals he outsmarted the ghosts. I put one over on that old ghost. <laughs> I hear this out. <laughs> That's what you think. Who said that? I don't know. Who said that? I don't know. I did. <laughs> Those darn ghosts won't give them any kind of a break. Well, now, completely broke. They, uh, scared, run off and to their next adventure in Professor Creeps. Uh, it's a very enjoyable film. Uh, uh, Moran and uh, Miller, they play well off each other. And uh, Sheffield makes a great early villain. Uh, there's not too many ghostly effects, but uh, what they do do, do do, 
what they do use are pretty effective although it's only in the last maybe 10 minutes of the film if that that uh, we get any of it or any real ghost effects although the uh, the transparency of them in the graveyard is kind of neat and, uh, and the skeleton's pretty good too and I like the uh, <laughs> the walking suit of armor <laughs> <laughs> that uh, scares them at one point. Uh, yeah, Mantan was basically a big star on this, uh, in these kind of uh, all black actor films. And in fact, the last two he made actually had his name in them. Uh, let's see if I can find that. Yeah, uh, Mantan messes up in 46, and Mantan runs for mayor in 46. And then there's Tall Tan and Terrific, which was a comedy mystery short in which he actually uh, played a romantic uh, hero in that one. But, uh, after that, uh, well, I mean, there were more. He did some westerns with uh, Jeb Yule. But, uh, yeah, I really like uh, the humor he displays in this. There's some cliched stuff, such as when uh, he and Miller uh, get these huge chickens that they're going to eat at the nightclub. And, you know, it's kind of a cliched uh, kind of thing about chicken. And, uh, but for the most part, uh, Mantan is the star of this film. Uh, the, the dancing scenes with him and, uh, who played the hostess? Let's see here. Uh, uh, Florence O'Brien. They, again, they play well off each other. And I like how she's just a little schemer because uh, she's fine with Sheffield until Sheffield's broke. Then she turns her sights on to to Morlin, and, which is funny because uh, before that she was playing up to him to uh, get him to gamble all his money away. But now that he's got all the money, she's playing up to him to because he's got all the money. And there aren't any real heroes in this film. Oh, except maybe the ghosts, really. Because uh, Sheffield plays a uh, plays a bad guy. He's a crooked gambler. And Moreland and Miller, they're, uh, <laughs> they're not exactly saints either, having tried to steal food uh, and being professional gamblers, basically. So... Not too worried about at the end of this. I'm sure they'll uh, find another mark that they can uh, make money on with dice and uh, get into another mess. <laughs> yeah, very, very enjoyable film. I liked it a lot. Uh, and I, I also like that other people in the cast got to be funny. It wasn't just Miller and Moreland. They were, like, everybody got to be a little bit of comedy here and there. And, and that's always fun. Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll get comedies where secondary characters are just to be straight, uh, straight men, straight people, straight people, uh, or to be the butt of the joke. But here, uh, everybody gets to have a few witty lines. And Sheffield's <laughs> comedy is pretty good. I love the thing where he ate the cigar because <laughs> he was so mad. <laughs> Yeah, very, uh, very enjoyable little film. Uh, of course, uh, these kinds of uh, all-black casts wouldn't uh, become popular again until the 70s with the black exploitation uh, uh, genre that uh, erupted uh, from uh, Gordon Parks and Melvin Van Peebles films. You know, Sweet Sweetbacks, Badass Song, and Shaft and a few others and but even that ran its course by the mid to late 70s but uh, nowadays we have 
such things as all black films, all Asian films, and they play to a non-segregated audience these days, you know, like uh, Crazy Rich Asians, Black Panther, you know. So we've come a long way. Uh, please hit like, share, and subscribe. Uh, stay after for my uh, the credits for my favorite scene. And next week, we're going to try and do a Charlie Chan.